You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Okay, welcome to the show. Now, today is part two of the episode that we did with JL Collins two weeks ago, uh, talking about what if the market crashes. But we ended up talking to JL for several hours that day, and there was no feasible way to get all of that information into one episode. So today we're going to come back and we're going to kind of let you behind the scenes at a very interesting discussion that we had talking about community and the value of community, a little bit of the origin of Chautauquas, and maybe where this five movement is going in the future. The second half of this episode is an Ask Me Anything or AMA with JL Collins. And we actually told our Facebook group ahead of time that this was coming and we asked them, what questions would you like us to tackle with JL? So the second half of this episode will be heavily weighted towards that. And finally, for those of you hardcore Choose FIers, make sure you stay tuned to the very end because we have a very special bonus surprise slash announcement for you. Okay. With that being said, let's do it. So JL, yeah, I just wanted to start off this conversation just by thanking you for for being willing to come back on the show. The fact that we get a chance to have this continuity and that it wasn't just a one-off interview, but that it's kind of, it's a conversation and we can continue this conversation as there's new things that prompt us, as there's new information to discuss. It's just, it's really cool to be able to share this time with you and thank you for, for being willing to come back on. Yeah, no, that's great. And you guys have done a fabulous job. I particularly enjoyed your interview with Alan and with Keith, the wealthy accountant. And I enjoyed it because I enjoyed listening to you guys, but also I, I happen to be friends with both those guys. And I think I have a huge respect for both of them. I think they're both brilliant in their unique fields. And so it was kind of a real pleasure to listen to them. And even though I know them and I've had a fair number of conversations with both of them, I I still learned a bunch of stuff listening to you guys interview them. In addition to that, I know you and Wealthy Accountant have actually spent a fair amount of time together, but also you and Alan do the Chautauqua in the UK together, right? Well, we are. We It's more a future thing. It's coming up in August to be the first one we've done together. Uh, so the answer to that is, yes, we are going to rather than we have done. Uh, it's it's in the middle of August. And, and just a little origin story on that, Alan and his wife, Katie, uh, were attendees at Chautauqua last year in Ecuador. And... I, Alan, well, you've met Alan, you've talked to him, you've interviewed him, and you know from firsthand, it doesn't take long to realize that this is a pretty special guy. And when you're with him face to face, that becomes maybe even more apparent more quickly. And so I, you know, everybody who comes to Chautauqua, it just attracts an amazing group of people. But even in that amazing group of people, Alan kind of stood out to me. And I, mean, I think partially because I'm he's the personality type that, I, that I'm personally comfortable with. But anyway, I, you know, day by day, I got to know him better and better. And about the middle of the week, it's the idea of partnering with him to do a Chautauqua began to form in my head. And I had always wanted to to try doing a Chautauqua other than Ecuador, but you need somebody on the ground in the location to do the logistics. And of course, Cheryl, who's the partner in Ecuador, knows Ecuador, and she knows that thoroughly. She's on the ground in Ecuador, but that doesn't translate to other countries. And and then the last day, I notice Alan is running around, kind of buttonholing all of the attendees one by one, and I'm not sure what's going on, and I'm busy doing other stuff, so I'm not paying real close attention. But I do kind of notice this. And at dinner that night, he presents to to me and the other speakers, this wonderful slideshow. He'd gone around and taken pictures of each attendee, and he managed to get a picture that that really captured by their expression and their location that person's uniqueness. And then he got from them uh, a one or two line quote on each of the four speakers. You know, what they thought of, of each of, of the four of us. 
and he presented that to us as a gift. So we had this this thing of photograph of everybody who attended and these really nice things that they chose to say about each of us. And in talking to him about it, I said, this is, Alan, this is wonderful. I can't thank you enough. I mean, I, where did this idea come from? He said, Jim, I, I woke up this morning and it just popped into my head and I decided to do it. And I'm thinking, holy cow, this guy comes up with this idea in the morning and by dinner time, he's gotten all these photographs, he's gotten all these quotes, and he's formatted it and and made this beautiful thing. And I I thought, here's a guy who who not only has brilliant ideas, but who knows how to execute. Yeah. And it's exactly what you just said that makes me so excited that he's partnering with us for that contest that we're doing. I, can you imagine his ability to look at a problem differently is, is so valuable. And then, and then not just look at the problem differently, but then implement the plan. That's the beauty of it. He just he just does it. Yeah, he's he's a dynamic guy. And, uh, and, so, and so then just to finish the story, at that point, I had been thinking for like maybe two days at that point that Alan might be a really good partner for the Chautauqua. I had to buttonhole him and, and run it past him. And again, I'm really busy at Chautauqua, so I hadn't had the chance. And when he delivered that, I thought, I've definitely got to, I mean, this, this is the guy. And literally has we were saying our goodbyes and he was getting on the bus to go to the airport to catch his flight back. I said to him, Alan, I want to plant a seed in your head and I don't want an answer now. You don't have to respond to it now. I just want you to think about it. And and when you're ready, get back to me. What would you think about partnering to do a Chautauqua in the UK? And you know, you do the logistics there like Cheryl does them here. And he looked at me and he said, Jim, I don't have to think about it. We're going to do it. And he turned around, he got on the bus and, and the rest is history. Then we talked, of course, many times after that and, and, uh, put this thing together. And now come August, we're going to do it. Yeah. Hopefully it'll be the beginning of, of, a you know, of a series of them. Yeah, that's wonderful. I definitely plan to attend a Chautauqua in the future. And to the audience out there, if you want to attend a similar event, Camp Mustache in Florida is being held the first week of January. And I know there still are tickets available. Actually, Brad, I'm I'm sorry to burst your bubble. I've actually talked to Stephen, the director of the camps down in Florida fairly recently. And as of a about two or three days ago, all the tickets are completely sold out for both weeks as well. So to our audience, though, if you are interested in going uh, while you at, you cannot purchase these tickets right now, they are completely sold out. Stay tuned to the end of the episode. I do have a special announcement for you. And Jim, are there I'm assuming the Chautauqua is sold out for this year, yes. but uh, tickets will go on sale for the 2018 Ecuador and UK versions, and people can find that on your blog, right? Yeah, we haven't uh, put them, you're correct that they are sold out for both the UK and Ecuador for this year, and we haven't opened the, the gates for 2018 yet, but mainly because we haven't finalized the dates and locations and all that. The Ecuador ones will, of course, do in Ecuador again, and we have some standard resorts that we go to. Uh, with Alan, we're actually talking about moving it from the UK. And he he and uh, Katie also is part of this process. He and Katie feel that they could do this pretty much anywhere in Europe. And it reminds you of how compact Europe is. So we're talking about different locations for 2018. We're talking about maybe the Greek islands, which is the leading contender at this point, or Spain or Portugal or even Morocco. So uh, that's kind of the plan for that one is maybe to rotate it around to to different countries so i and i find that very exciting camp mustache by the way they have been very kind about inviting me to go to camp mustache and it has never worked out i have heard nothing but great things about camp mustache from the people who've gone to it and it is on my agenda to do one of these days and i keep telling the organizers because i keep saying no i can't do it they I get the same breath. I say, please don't stop inviting me. Please don't stop inviting me because I, I definitely want to do it. Uh, and one of these days, the stars will align and it'll work out. It just sounds like a wonderful time and, and I want to be part of it. Well, when you do eventually come, we will be there. And what I loved about this just little segment, this conversation was just that people are aching for this sense of community and mm-hmm. you can feel it. It's this palpable sense to connect with people that agree that buying a brand new $60,000 car when you have no net worth and no savings is dumb. And, and you just don't find people on your block, on your street that have this similar mentality about this common sense approach to life. And when you get a chance just to spend a week or a few days or a day with like-minded people, uh, once you realize what an uplifting time it is, 
you, you crave it. And so inevitably what happens is the people that went the first year end up wanting to come back the second year, but they've told their friends about it. And now their friends are trying to get access to come as well. And there's just not enough room. And so what I love is that as this idea grows and as more and more people latch onto this as something that they want to build into their yearly schedule, we're going to need to have more of these events. And I think we're going to continue to see this momentum build. And it's really going to be something that we can all look forward to. And so I love the momentum that you're seeing with the Chautauquas. And I love the fact that you've been able to branch out just from doing it in Ecuador now that you're doing it with Alan. And since you are two of my favorite people, the idea that this is something that you're going to be able to do together is obviously something that we are following with interest. You know, Jonathan, you are absolutely right about the camaraderie. And when we did the very first Chautauqua, I mean, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I was, I I sort of crafted this idea and this concept and we'd bring a bunch of people to Ecuador and we limited it to 25. So we'd bring a small group to Ecuador and we'd show them some of Ecuador and I'd get some bloggers like myself and we'd give some talks and then we'd arrange one-on-one sessions with them and, you know, we'd take them to a nice resort resort and we'd have good food. And so it was kind of a cool looking week. And towards the end of that first week, I I made it a point to go around and ask individually each person, how have you enjoyed it? And of course, as I could tell from watching them during the week, they all said, oh, this is great. And then I said, so what's the coolest thing? What's been the coolest thing about this for you? And obviously I'm hoping they're going to say to me, Jim, it was your talk. (laughs) (laughs) You know, nobody said that. And I thought, well, okay, maybe if it wasn't my talk, maybe it would be Pete, Mr. Money Mustache's talk, or one of the other speakers. Now, nobody said, nobody picked any of those. Well, maybe it'd be the one-on-one, so nobody picked any of the one-on-one sessions where we sit down individually. Well, maybe it was seeing Ecuador, you know, we take them around and show them so No, it wasn't that. The thing that every single person individually said, the coolest thing about it was Finally, for the first time in their life, in many cases, they got to hang out with people who got it. As one person said to me, I found my tribe. Because if you're walking this FI path, you are the odd one out. Even it's growing, but we are very much the odd ones out in the general society. And the vast majority of people who walk this path like we do don't have anybody in their day-to-day life that they work with and their family and their set of friends who who are doing this or really understand it. And you hear that repeatedly. It's so hard to explain to pe- to the uninitiated what this is all about. And so this idea that they can come to Chautauqua and hang out with people who get it, they don't have to explain themselves to. They can just build on this commonality. Or they can go to Camp Mustache and do the same thing. Or they can come to my blog or to your podcast or to other blogs and podcasts in the space and, and build the community. It's And I, I had, when I was thinking about creating this thing, and I imagine this would be the same of the people who created Camp Mustache, it never occurred to me that that would be the single most powerful thing. It just never crossed my mind. And, and every Chautauqua since I've asked, and I think I've asked, if not every person, awfully close. And they have all said the same thing. Yeah. And I can personally say that that was the case at the event that we went to this past January. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely see that in common as well. Um, we don't have another hot seat in its purest form for you today, but what we do have is a little mini ask me anything segment planned. And we actually put this out to our Facebook group to basically say, hey, we're going to be interviewing JL and we're going to be doing this conversation about wealth allocation models and talking about the second part of the stock series. But give us your thoughts. What would you like to know? What additional questions would add value to this conversation? And so we had tons of feedback. But we and, picked, you, and you and you picked the ones that were most likely to trip me up. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, I did. I, I could feel it coming. <laughs> it was going to be the hot seat. Should I replay the intro? I, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Okay. So this is the part of the story where I break back into my Batman dialogue. Bum bum bum. And if you remember where we left off, we were asking the question about fixed annuity. So I'm just going to break right into that conversation for you. I think that after we work through all these individual pieces like allocation, the the one thing that kind of stands out that I'd like to see discussed, and I believe this is actually going to set us up for a question from Amber from our Facebook group, was this idea of fixed income. People talk about things like annuities and all these other fancy vehicles, maybe even reverse mortgages to provide fixed income and the value of just having set income. But 
we haven't really talked about that in the context of saying that just index fund investing. I'm just wondering in your mind as a financial planning tool and as an alternate vehicle, do those fit inside the FI universe at all? Is there any place for them? Is they Are they something that you consider or that you've talked about in your blog at all? Okay. So I only recommend and suggest investing in uh, stocks, either a total stock market index fund like VTSAX or maybe an S&P 500 uh, index fund and bonds, a total bond market index fund. And you accomplish the goal that you're talking about by balancing those two. So the more bonds you add, the less volatility you have. As we talked about a moment ago, Bonds don't pay a lot of interest anymore, but they pay a little bit more than stocks. The 4% rule suggests that on a given portfolio that is at least 50% stocks, because you need stocks for the growth over time, at least 50% stocks and 50% bonds on up to 75, 25 on up, you can draw about 4% from that. Now, the total stock market index fund has a dividend of just under 2% these days, and that'll vary depending on what the price is because that affects the percentages in ways that we probably don't want to go down that rabbit hole right here. But it's paying about a little less than 2%. Total bond market index I haven't looked at, but it's probably paying two and a half, two and three quarters, maybe nudging up towards 3%, so not a whole lot more. Again, we're using bonds largely for ballast against the volatility of stocks. So you're not going to get, just by drawing interest and dividends, you're not going to get to your 4%. You're going to have to sell some shares as you go along. That's part of the 4% rule, which suggests that that works okay. Now, some people, uh, Jonathan, as you point out, especially some older people, are not comfortable with that. And annuities or reverse mortgages, which are a newer product that are out there, promise them in this low interest rate environment, in this low return environment, they promise them a way to get greater returns on on their investments. I'm not a fan, and I'm not a fan because both of those products are laden with fees. And we can talk about either one of them or both of them in some detail, but in addition to the fees, they, they have other fairly serious drawbacks. So let me talk. Reverse mortgages, I I particularly don't care for, for a lot of reasons, and I'm not sure we want to make that part of this particular podcast. But let's talk about annuities a little bit, because I think those are maybe the more common thing that people are looking at or as an alternative. And let me begin by saying I am not an expert in annuities, but I have never read anything about annuities that have made them attractive to me. So what the proposition, what the positive proposition for an annuity is, is basically that you can get a higher return on a given amount of money than you can from stocks or bonds or a savings account or other alternatives. So that's one thing. The annuity will pay you that return as long as you live. So it's a guaranteed income and that appeals to a lot of people. So you can buy an annuity for 50,000, 100,000, a million or whatever, and you will get a guaranteed income for life. So that's those are the things that appeal to people about annuities. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the downsides. Number one is understand that when you buy an annuity, and typically you are buying them from an insurance company, let's just say for the argument, sake of argument, you're buying a $100,000 annuity, you give the insurance company your $100,000. That money's gone forever. You are never going to see that money again. In exchange, the, the insurance company says, Jonathan, I will pay you a certain amount of return on that money, certain interest rate level return on that money. It will be higher than what you could get in bonds or savings account. Uh, and I will pay that to you until the time you die. So it is guaranteed income. And when you die, the insurance company keeps the money. Now, the way the insurance company can keep, can pay higher than normal interest on their annuities is because they pool it together. So a large number of people buy the annuities. Some of them are going to live a long time and, and the annuities are going to work out wonderfully well for them. And some of them are going to die early. And then there's going to be a continuum between the ones that die really early and the ones that live really long and people are going to be dying off. And every time somebody dies off, the insurance company keeps to, gets to keep the money. And because not everybody is going to live long enough to collect those high interest rates, the insurance company can make a huge profit while still paying out 
higher than than market interest rates. I hope that makes some oh, kind of yeah. This is the uh, this is the one time where being a smoker actually makes you more valuable. the The insurance company is is asking, pleading. They want smokers in their risk pool. Please, please sign on the dotted line. Right. They are saying yes, please, and 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 let me buy your next next pack of cigarettes. Yeah, <laughs> let's right. help you. So with yeah, that. so so the insurance company when they when they are selling annuities, they are hoping that you die early. I mean, I, I'm sure not to that makes them sound awful. I'm sure they're not sitting in their office, but the insurance companies know in any given pool of people, some of them are going to live to a ripe old age, and some of them are going to die early. And they have databases that allow them to predict this with incredible precision. Now they can't predict whether I'm going to be one who dies early or lives long or Jonathan or, or you, Brad, or anybody in our audience. But if they took everybody listening to this collectively, they can predict how many of us are going to die at any given age with incredible precision. And because they know a fair number of people are going to die early, then they know that they and they get to keep all this money, they can afford to pay a little bit higher interest rate than you could get from a certificate of deposit or that a corporate bond or a government bond is going to pay. So that's how annuities are able to pay more money than some of the other alternatives. The problem is that annuities tend to be laden with very, very high fees and very high costs. So that's something that that would concern me. The other thing is that you are assuming when you buy an annuity that that insurance company is going to survive. And in a sense, it's like buying one stock. I like buying the total stock market index fund, because when I own the entire stock market, I don't care if it one company or even several companies belly up and go out of business because they're always new blood coming in. But if I buy just one company, if I buy just XYZ company and that company bellies up, I got a problem. And if I buy an annuity, I'm buying it from one insurance company. And if that insurance company bellies up, I have a problem. Now, that problem is mitigated by the fact that the insurance, the annuities are backed by certain federal insurance guarantees, but I'm not sure I would want to have to live through having that pay out. So there is that there's that one company insurance risk that theoretically is covered, but I think it would be an ugly thing to live through if the insurance company that you happen to buy your annuity from 15 years into your annuity when you're 85 happens to belly up. It's not something I would want to deal with. You can get out of annuities, but just like they're high cost to get into them and to hold them, it's very expensive to to exit them. And then, of course, the final thing is that you give up all of your principal. So if I buy a bond fund, if I buy a total bond fund, I am not going to get as much interest every year as I'll get from an annuity, but I'll have a much smaller costs involved in it. And when I die, I will still have something to pass on to my heirs, whoever they might be. So I have never heard anything about annuities that would make me recommend them or want to own them. Thank you for for summarizing your thoughts on that. That's very valuable. And I think there's a lot of people that have been trying to verbalize that answer that this will help that conversation. All right. So this next question is from Emily. And Emily says, we're longtime fans of Mr. Collins. Would love to hear his take on international equity allocation. I remember at one point that was part of your portfolio. I think you've made some modifications to your thoughts on that within the last several years. Am I right on that? No, you're probably, uh, actually you're not, Jonathan. You're you're probably remembering uh, REITs. Uh, REITs used to be part of my portfolio and I, I, I no longer hold those. Yeah, I was thinking of REITs. So yeah. what are your thoughts on international equity allocation and why do you not hold any? Well, I actually, I, I do have a post in the SOC series uh, about exactly this subject. So if anybody wants more detail on it, uh, they can go to my blog and I forget what number it is in the stock series, but it's international funds and you'll see it there. I don't hold international and I don't see the need to hold international and really for three reasons. Uh, number one, we've got it covered. Uh, number two, it's more expensive and and number three, there's more risk. So let's quickly walk through those and I'll, I'll explain what I mean. When I say we've got it covered, when you own VTSAX, which is the total stock market index fund, which is my sort of go-to investment choice, VTSAX is heavily tilted towards the S&P 500. About 80% of it is made up of the S&P 500, which are the largest, the 500 largest companies in the US. And if you look at the top 100 of those, ballpark speaking, 
uh, even down a little bit, which make up, I don't know how much of that 80%, but because it's weighted in the index, a large percentage of it, they are international businesses. So when you own America's businesses, which you do by owning VTSAX, you already have huge exposure in the international market because you're owning companies like General Electric and Apple and Microsoft and Ford that are international businesses by definition. So we already have tremendous international exposure. I believe that the rest of the world, I don't believe that the rest of the world is growing just as the U.S. is growing. The world economy is doing well. I believe that other countries will continue to do well. I want to participate in that. But if I own VTSAX, I own these major American corporations, which are already major players in those markets. And so I'm, I'm already covered. The second reason I mentioned was high costs. So when you're in something like VTSAX, your expense ratio, the cost to own that fund is rock bottom. It's about 0.05%, if I recall correctly. When you go to international funds, which is what you have to do in order to own international companies, by definition, your expense ratios go up. And that's understandable because it takes more effort for the companies running the funds to explore the entire world. So you have increased costs. And the third point that I made is that there's more risk. So as imperfect as the U.S. market is, it is still the most transparent and upfront market on the planet. So the further afield you go from the U.S., the murkier things get, and particularly when you go into emerging economies. I mean, if you're going into things like Europe, you know, that's that's pretty cut and dry and pretty clean. Canada, you know, Australia, those kinds of places. But the accounting standards as you go into smaller and smaller countries and stock markets become murkier and murkier. And so there is more risk involved. So between those three that we've already got a lot of international coverage in U.S. companies, we can do it without the higher costs and we can do it with with a little less risk, a little more transparency. I just don't see the need for international. Now, having said all that, not everybody agrees. In fact, the vast majority of people uh, disagree with me on that. And if any of our listeners disagree with it and they want to hold international, I wouldn't fight you too hard on that. And I'm not suggesting it is a bad thing to do. In fact, if costs were ever to come down enough, there are funds that in just like VTSAX is the total U.S. stock market, there are funds that are total world funds. And if those costs ever come down and as the U.S., as inevitably it will, becomes a smaller part of that pie, maybe at some point, I'd go into a, uh, a total world fund. And if I had somebody commenting on the blog uh, not too recently saying that's what they were doing, and I don't have any great objection to that either, but I'm not there yet. Okay. All right. So this one was from Jeff and Jeff says, I'd like to know more details about when Jim thinks it's a good time to reallocate to more bonds. I'm in hundred percent equities right now, but we'll be buying more bonds as well as cash a year or two before FI. So what I'm thinking is this goes back to our conversation of wealth building versus wealth preservation. And I don't even want to tie it to an age. I want to say for that person that's about to pull the trigger on their FI date, what's their mental game plan for that that rebalancing, uh, moving from wealth building to wealth preservation? What does that look like? So that's a, that's a great question from Jeff and a great addition there, Jonathan, that, that you just added to it. I think it depends on the individual's risk tolerance, as we talked about earlier. So as you said, Jonathan, it's in, in this day and age, and particularly with the audience we're addressing, the FI community, it's not just a function of age. In the old days, it was, you know, you worked 40 years, you hit 60, 65, whatever it was, and and then you retired and that's when it shifted. But nowadays, people are, are quitting paid. I hate the term retirement because that sounds too passive, but people are stepping away from paid employment to do unpaid things and living off their investments. And then sometimes they're stepping back and they're stepping uh, back and forth, maybe several times in, in a lifetime. So that's that wealth building versus wealth preservation stage. When you, when you have income coming in from your labor and your wealth building, then I tilt very heavily towards stocks. I, I should say that I tend to be very aggressive. So anybody listening wants to temper it with their own personal comfort level. When you're living off your portfolio, again, as we talked about, you want bonds 
to kind of smooth that volatility in the way your cash flow did. As to where that mark is depends, frankly, a lot on your tolerance for volatility and against your, your desire for gains. The thing that anybody listening has to understand is in a, any given period of time, at least if it's long enough, short periods of time, of course, don't count, but over, if you have a fairly long period of time that you're looking at, the more you hold in stocks, the better your performance will be and the wilder the ride will be. The more you hold in bonds, the lower the performance, the smoother the ride. And only the individual can decide for themselves which is more important to them. So we talked about Jeremy at Gold Curry Cracker. He's 100% stocks. Jeremy has obviously said, I don't care about the smooth ride. I want maximum performance over time. If somebody else said, you know, the volatility is going to keep me up at night, yeah, then they're going to want a lot more in bonds. Somebody like Jack Bogle, the founder of, of Vanguard, the inventor of index funds. Of course, Jack, Jack is in his late 80s. Jack is very conservative. I think Jack holds 40% stocks and 60% bonds. And there are few people who are smarter investors than Jack Bogle. So there's there's the range. I tend to be uh, uh, more aggressive, as, as we talked about earlier, uh, with the income from the blog and the book. I'm even uh, talking about uh, or thinking about going 100% stocks again, and where I'm currently uh, 75 stocks and 25% bonds. So Jim, one of our community members, Brad, followed up with a question about how you mechanically go through this process. So uh, he said, do you sell one and buy the other to rebalance or do you start to allocate more to bonds as you get closer to retirement? This seems to create two taxable events of the same money one to rebalance and one when you finally withdraw. I guess he's trying to figure out, you know, does he understand this right? Is there a better way to rebalance than than his understanding of this? So, so that is a simple question that is somewhat complex to answer because we have to consider, first of all, how much money you have in taxable accounts, how much of your investment are in taxable accounts, and how much are in tax-advantaged accounts like 401ks and IRAs. Um, and he's also asking when to make the transition. So do you start moving, let's say you know in five years that you're going to quit paid work for a while or maybe permanently. So do you wait until you actually quit to put your bond allocation in or do you begin over time moving in that direction? So kind of two different questions. So let's take the, the first one that I mentioned. Let's start with whether or not you do this over time or immediately. That again falls directly into your tolerance for risk. Personally, I didn't do it until I stopped having earned income. And then I went out and I acquired my bonds. That is the more aggressive choice. That's not necessarily the right comfort level choice for Brad, in this case, who's asking the question. So if you want to begin slowly building your bond position as you ramp up to when you're going to step away from paid work, that's a perfectly fine thing to do. Again, remembering our caveat that the more bonds you have, the smoother the ride, the lower the performance. So that's the trade-off uh, that you're making. In terms of the mechanics of rebalancing, whenever possible, you want to do whatever rebalancing you're going to do in your tax-advantaged accounts, because then when you buy or sell something, it is not a taxable event. So personally, for instance, I keep all of my taxable investments in VTSAX in the stock fund because it has less income than the bonds and I'm going to hold it for a long time and I'm not going to be rebalancing it. I do my rebalancing within the IRA so it is not a taxable event. Now, the mechanics of doing it are, are really pretty simple. If you decide, once you decide on your allocation, let's say like me, you decide on 75, 25%, slowly over time, that allocation will get out of whack. This is not something, by the way, you have to do all that often. Once a year is, is usually plenty. So slowly out of time, it'll get out of whack, either because the stock market is rising and therefore your percentage of stock starts to grow, or the stock market's falling and your percentage of bonds starts to grow. But once a year, and I choose my wife's birthday just because it's randomly. She doesn't think it's random, and she says it better be fixed in a permanent part of your to-do list every single year. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, and this gives me two reasons to remember it. 
Uh, well but played. it's random, and as far as the stock market's concerned, it's random. And and I avoid the end of the year, the end and the beginning of the year, because a lot of people are doing are readjusting their portfolios then, and the market gets a little screwy sometimes. So I would suggest people just pick a random time that's not at the beginning or the end of the year. And your birthday, your wife's birthday, your child's birthday any random day would work. And then you revisit it. And if you see that your stocks have gone up, you just ideally, again, in your tax advantaged account, you just sell enough of that and you put it right into the bonds to bring that balance back into place. If your stocks have gone down and by definition, the bonds have gone up, you're selling off the bonds and you're shifting the money into into stocks. So the mechanics are pretty simple. Okay. And David has a question for you. He says, I think Collins is too aggressive in his recommended equity allocation. You could ask him about that. And when he says equities always go up, perhaps you could show him the chart of Japan's equity returns over the past 30 years. While the U.S. is around 50% of publicly traded equities, we're only around 25% of the world GDP. Should we really go 100% VTSEX? World economic leaders come and go. I think we'll always be on top because we're America. But (laughs) what if we go in decline? Yeah. So uh, we did cover a lot of this in our our conversation already. But but let me kind of address it as as if we if we didn't. So so David is correct. I I tend to be very aggressive, suggesting that that people be a hundred percent in stocks, even in the wealth acquisition stage, uh, is a very aggressive posture to have. So Mia culpa, I am aggressive. It's interesting to me to listen to David's comment because at the same time I get comments on the blog who are looking for still more aggressive things to do. And I think that's a function of the fact we've been in a long bull market. So I'll frequently get people who are saying, uh, you know, if you went into the small cap uh, index fund, that has performed better than VTSAX. And why don't you recommend that? Well, the reason I don't recommend that is kind of what David's talking about. That's very aggressive. It is more, it has performed better than than the total stock market index fund, at least in the recent decades. No guarantee that's going to continue. It is more volatile by definition. So when we have the next economic collapse, it's going to drop. So I'm kind of caught between the two. There are people like David who are saying, ah, you're too aggressive. And there's a case to be made for that. And then there are people who are saying, oh, you're not aggressive enough. We could, you know, we should go into small caps and be and be more aggressive. Everybody kind of has to decide for themselves where their, where their comfort level is. And if if what I'm recommending is too aggressive for David or for anybody else, then they should absolutely do what what makes them comfortable. You have to sleep at night. None of this is worth it if it keeps you up at night. And the less comfortable doing anything I recommend makes you, the more prone to panic and run you will be when the inevitable plunge happens. So by all means, dial, dial back my level of aggressiveness to your level of tolerance. And by the same token, you know, if you're more aggressive than I am, like Jeremy at Go Curry Cracker is and some of these other commentators, and you understand the additional volatility you're taking on, and you are absolutely sure you won't panic when the inevitable happens, you know, my level of aggressiveness is my level of aggressiveness. It's It can be fine-tuned to anybody's uh, individual situation. The Japan thing, we, we kind of talked about it with the Great Depression. Japan, for those listeners who might not know, in the early 90s, as I recall, had a major stock market plunge and they are still struggling to recover completely from it. I am somewhat famous for saying the stock market always goes up and it does have a bias for going up for a variety of reasons. There is no reason that we could not experience something like Japan went through. It would be a black swan as we talked about it. It would be a rare. I don't expect it to happen. But there's no guarantee that you know, the market can, can and will do anything. The question you have to ask yourself, it seems to me, is when you're making investment decisions, what scenario do you want to invest for? So is it possible the U.S. market will fall into a malaise that has happened in Japan? Yes, it's possible. It's a black swan. Do you want to construct an investment portfolio around that possibility? Or do you want to construct your investment portfolio around the much more likely possibility that, as we discussed over the last 40 years, disaster after disaster, setback after setback, the market returns huge percentages? I think that you, for me, 
I am going to play the odds and I'm going to invest against what's most likely to happen that we will face over the next 40 years, every bit as many challenges as we did over the last 40 years. And the stock market still has this very powerful upward bias and it will still be the best place to invest. Can I guarantee that? Nothing in life is guaranteed. The only way you can guarantee anything is by your personal flexibility. But you have to decide for yourself, do you want to invest against the possibility of a black swan, which by definition is rare, or the much more likely scenarios? And that, again, becomes a very personal uh, choice. Okay. Well, I got one more for you, if you can handle it. Oh, I think we Go have ahead. a couple minutes left. And this is from Felissa, who we actually met at Camp Mustache. So it's well time for our last question here. And she wanted to know your thoughts on inflation. And I'm personally interested in this because I know in your blog series, you, you did talk about it. And you mentioned Zimbabwe as one of the black swan examples of what inflation can do to a country. And my wife is actually from Zimbabwe. So it's a very really? personal. Yeah, a very personal story for me. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So there's different kinds of inflation, first of all. So people listening may be familiar with the Federal Reserve and, and the Federal Reserve adjusts interest rates. And basically what the Federal Reserve wants in the economy is some inflation because some inflation is grease for the economic wheels. So the Federal Reserve is targeting, I think, maybe 2% a year annual inflation. Some inflation is good. Deflation, which is what happened in the Great Depression, is a really horrible thing because what happens in deflation is prices are dropping and because prices are dropping, people say, why should I buy this couch today when I can buy it tomorrow? And suddenly nobody's buying anything and then you wind up with a Great Depression. Inflation is the very opposite. If inflation starts increasing beyond those modest levels, and one of the reasons modest levels are grease for the wheels, is it motivates people to buy things today. So if you know that if I buy the couch today, next year it will probably be more expensive. You are more likely to buy that couch or that car, or whatever it is. So a little bit of inflation is a good thing. The problem is that when governments start printing too much money, inflation like it did in Zimbabwe, like it did in Germany in the 1920s, it can become runaway. And there are few things that destroy an economy more thoroughly than that or that are scarier. As we mentioned earlier, when we went through that 40-year period from 75 to 2015 and all the challenges that were faced there, the first one I think I mentioned was inflation, which was a big issue in the in the uh, mid to to late 70s, early 80s, and the Federal Reserve managed to, to bring that under control. But, you know, we were up at a point where inflation was getting around 15%, which is starting to get scary. You know, when you get to Zimbabwe, you're talking about it's going up thousands of percent a day. So, um, uh, yeah, I have literally very... held a $1 trillion note. I have held it in my hand. Yes. And, and it probably was worth less than a penny. Yeah. Well, no, it was worth a so, dollar twenty nine from the guy that was trying to sell it outside the bus stop I was at. Yeah, really. <laughs> it was, yeah, okay. it was, a, so, it was a, so there you go. Yeah, it was a uh, what do you call it? I guess just a souvenir, right? Yeah. So that's inflation writ large. I mean, and and it is it is it's one of the ugliest things that can happen to an economy, and that's why it's what's happening in Venezuela as we speak. It just absolutely destroys an, an economy because the, the currency eventually becomes worthless, and 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 that's a that's a very very serious matter. Stocks overall tend to be inflation hedges because when you own stock, you own a piece of a company. When you own a piece of a company, you own their equipment, you own their products, you own, you know, everything that you own tangible assets. And so when you have inflation, those tangible assets go up along with as the value of your dollar plummets or your currency, whatever it is, plummets. Because you own assets, the value of that, those assets goes up in turn and it protects you. Now, if inflation gets too far out of control, even even that protection begins to to collapse. But um, yeah, runaway inflation is is a is a truly horrible thing, just like runaway deflation is. All right. So Matt says, why is Jim in a different type of bond than what he recommends? Why did he pick that fund from Vanguard and does he recommend it for others? 
So, uh, first of all, kudos, kudos to Matt, because he, he must be a close reader of my blog, because that information is on the blog, but it's intentionally buried. And it's in the stock series, I, I have a post on bonds, and uh, it's a fairly lengthy post. It goes step by step, and I forget what step I buried that little nugget of information in. <laughs> but nice, I buried, nice job, Matt. Nice job. <laughs> yeah, that was, so, so good catch, Matt, and, and it's my way of finding out who really reads my stuff uh, to any depth. Um, and he's right. Uh, I recommend on the blog and in my book that the bond allocation v be in VBTLX, which is Vanguard's total uh, bond market fund. It is the, the sort of the bookend of VTSAX, which is the total stock market fund. That is not actually, as he's caught me out on, that's not actually the bond fund I personally use. I personally use, and I'm not going to name it because I don't want to recommend it. I personally happen to use a corporate bond fund, an intermediate corporate bond fund. The reason I don't want to name it and I don't recommend it is because it is something that I might change at a moment's notice. I might go back into VBTLX uh, for my bonds because it is more conservative. It has government bonds as opposed to just corporate bonds. So I am, I'm kind of playing a little bit here. I, I would not want anybody to follow in my footsteps of playing because I'm not sh entirely sure that it's going to work. And I certainly don't want to be responsible if I turn and run for the exits of having to track down everybody who's following me and letting them know that we should be going for the exits. So the reason, if anybody is interested, a corporate bond fund tends to pay a little more interest. So it's a little more aggressive. I'm getting a little better return on it, but it's risky because it is only corporate. It is a little bit tied to how my stocks are going to do because, of course, with stocks, I own a piece of all these corporations. And with bonds, I am loaning them these same corporations, basically, or a lot of them, I am loaning them money. So in a way, by going with the corporate bond fund, I don't have the diversification that the bonds are designed to have in the portfolio. Because if we have a major collapse and those companies that have issued those bonds fall on hard times, their stock price is going to drop and there's a risk that they're going to default on the bonds. That's one of the reasons that it is a safer option to have government bonds, which is in, VP, in VBTLX, the total bond market fund, you have corporate and government. So it is a safer thing. And if you're just going to hold it and forget it for the long term, and that's the key to the simple path of wealth, is you buy these things and you hold them and you forget about them, then VBTLX is definitely the thing you want to be in. And it might be something that I myself return to it at some point. But right now I'm, I'm experimenting a little bit and I'm being a little more aggressive than I would be comfortable advising people in general to do. All right. And anybody, and by the way, anybody who just listened to that answer and says that I want to follow in your footsteps, I want to go to a corporate bond, intermediate corporate bond fund, and I want to be more aggressive, then you should have enough knowledge to go and find it on your own without my telling you what it is. And if you don't, <laughs> then you probably shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, Brad, do you get the feeling that like we're going to get an announcement from JL next year saying that he's 100% stocks? For a period of time it would not shock me but i i like that jim's thinking about it i mean i think that's that's what we should challenge the audience with for everything right is always consider your personal situation we say that all the time in the podcast and you know the facts on the ground change for jim right he has some more income coming in from the blog from the books and he's reconsidering what he's been doing for the last couple of years I, I think that's brilliant and i think that's how we all need to approach phi and approach this concept Brad, I, I, I agree with you. And that's one of the beauties of the dynamic I've tried to create in the book and the blog, where using these two simple tools, just a couple of simple tools that having a little bit of cash to pay your day-to-day -day bills, and then having a balance between stocks and bonds, if in fact you need bonds at all, it sounds very simple and it's only using two funds, but there's tremendous flexibility in how you implement that. You can you can become much more aggressive with it by being in all stocks. You bec you can become much more conservative with it by tilting more and more towards towards bonds. You can adjust what's going on in your personal life. You know, maybe like I did, you quit your job and you think, okay, I'm I'm done. I'm not going to have earned income ever again. And then the next thing you know, you started this little business and it's it starts to take off. So 
it's it's wonderfully simple and yet wonderfully flexible and adjusting to your different life situation. I love that. Simple and flexible. That's That really summarizes everything. I absolutely love that as a way to end this episode. So thank you very much, Jim. Well, as you can probably tell, I have an enormous amount of fun doing it. I love talking about it. You guys are great in your role as hosts. So it's entirely my pleasure and I'm honored and grateful that you'd invite me. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know it was a little bit different, uh, a little bit of a departure. I think in some ways it may have been even more enjoyable, especially for those of you that have been in the FIRE community for a long time. Uh, I know I certainly enjoyed it. And hopefully we'll get a chance to do something like this again in the future, maybe even do it as part of a panel where we can continue to uh, source questions from our community and send them to the thought leaders and the influencers in our space, the FI community. Going back full circle to that idea of community, I told you that I had an announcement and I want to go ahead and tell you about that now. So I have a, a hopefully game changing announcement for you. I hope you're as excited about it as I am. So let me start by saying that the camp in Florida that Brad and I will be attending that first week is sold out. It's also going to be featured as part of the documentary. So the documentary about the Phi community, that's happening. Scott is going to be there with this film crew that first week. So this is going to be amazing. Uh, the other half of this is that Stephen, the director of the camp down in Florida reached out to me and let me know that he has a single ticket. He loves the podcast and the community of Choose FI. And he's so excited about it that he asked whether or not Brad and I would be interested in doing one ticket as a giveaway for our community. And Brad and I obviously hopped on that as quickly as possible. And I, and I repeat, you cannot purchase these tickets. They are sold out. Uh, this will be January 5th through the 8th. It's three nights. All meals are included. You are responsible for transportation. So those are the details. Now, the question is, how do you enter the drawing? Well, we're going to use the same format that we've used for the book giveaways. And we're basically just going to keep that going. So for every five written reviews that we get on our Friday roundup, we enter you in a drawing for a copy of a book that we found useful. We've, we've been doing that for several months now, and it's definitely something that we're going to continue to do, but we're going to add an extra dimension to it. So if you're interested in participating in the drawing for this camp as well, because you'd like to go, still just leave us a written review by going to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Just follow the instructions there. And then once you've done that, send us an email to feedback at chooseify.com, letting us know what your screen name was so that we can match you up. And specifically, Specifically in that email, you do need to specify that you are interested in the drawing for camp. That will let us know to put you in that drawing. And yeah, we'll collect these up from the 14th of August through the 28th of August. And then we will announce the winner on the Friday roundup, the 1st of September, I believe. So those are all the details. And yeah, please, please send us your submissions. And we would love to get a chance to see you in Florida. So thank you so much for being a part of this. The fire is spreading, right, my friends? We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.